So Dr. Scholz, in this series we've been talking about urinary issues and oftentimes the whole internet comes at you when you Google urinary issues and tells you that you have prostate cancer. In reality, prostate cancer does not have symptoms and you have said that these urinary issues can be caused by BPH or prostatitis or an overactive bladder. We've kind of talked about BPH and prostate cancer, an overactive bladder and prostate cancer. Today I thought we'd talk about prostatitis and prostate cancer, but I thought we'd break it down and talk about kind of how it affects PSA and what treatments are there for prostatitis itself. So first of all, can you define what prostatitis is? So whenever you have the suffix itis, I-T-I-S, it means inflammation. So pulmonitis is inflammation of the lungs, um, urethritis, inflammation of the urethra, uh, dermatitis, inflammation, inflammation of the skin, and uh, inflammation of the prostate. It's, so it's a nonspecific term. Inflammation can come from infection, it can come from any kind of an injury, it can come from um, autoimmune, you know, overactive immune system. And that's about as well as we understand prostatitis. There are, when you talk about prostatitis, you probably talk about two main categories. One's acute uh, bacterial prostatitis, which is not a very common problem, but it happens. And pe men get sick, they have fevers, um, and they have pain uh, with urination, pain in their pelvic area. Uh, and it's treated with antibiotics, and it responds well to antibiotics. The prostatitis that is so common in my daily life, because we, we monitor hundreds of men uh, with low-grade prostate cancers, uh, is a uh, less symptomatic form that causes low-grade inflammation in the prostate and PSA elevations. Um, not high PSA from cancer, but from inflammation. So prostatitis is nonspecific uh, in my world, chronic low-grade prostatitis that I see, not acute prostatitis. Uh, is a uh, chronic low-grade inflammatory process that causes high PSA levels. So is there any particular thing that causes this inflammation? It's not well understood. There may be a viral component. Uh, I already mentioned an autoimmune component. Uh, autoimmune means overactive immune system. Um, again, going back to, let's say you have uh, autoimmune uh, inflammation of the lung. We call that asthma uh, or autoimmune inflammation of the skin. That might be eczema. Uh, the um, autoimmune inflammation of the uh, intestinal wall would be irritable bowel syndrome. So our immune systems can get overactive, and when they do, it can cause redness, inflammation, discomfort, pain, and uh, when that occurs in the prostate, we call that prostatitis. The underlying causes for this are not well understood. Why, why does the immune system overreact? Um, it's, uh, it's a fact of the human condition but it has not been well-defined. And honestly, the medical world is not pursuing aggressively trying to define it because it doesn't really turn into a, a, an illness. The destruction of the prostate through inflammation is not a big problem. Men are past uh, you know, trying to have children and whatnot. Uh, sometimes there'll be some low-grade discomfort or urinary symptoms, which we've sort of semi-covered in the other videos about overactive bladder and and BPH. Um, sometimes there'll be some low-grade symptoms from prostatitis as well. But it's not something that the medical world is out saying, we've got to fix prostatitis. It's not a big priority because it doesn't, uh, we don't generally think of it turning into cancer or, or, um, or into more serious forms of inflammation. It just creates confusing PSA levels. Sometimes there's some low-grade discomfort, um, but it, uh, not typically a, a debilitating condition. So how can you tell between a patient who has prostatitis and their PSA is rising and then prostate cancer? If you have a patient come into your office, how are you determining which one's which? Well, this is something we struggle with constantly. Uh, and the answer in the medical world, we call it a diagnosis of exclusion. What that means is that we look for all the possible ways that it could be coming from cancer or from some other condition. And after we've gone down the checklist and we've proven that it's none of those, we end up calling it prostatitis. Other ways that characteristically we see with prostatitis is that PSAs will jump around up and down. It's sort of an inflammatory pattern. Sometimes prostatitis will respond to anti-inflammatories like Aleve. We'll see a reduction in PSA. Or 5-alpha um, reductase inhibitors like Proscar and Avidart will cause declines in PSA. Uh, we don't typically see cancerous PSAs elevated responding to Aleve or to Proscar, Avidart, and things like that. So uh, our tools and methods for making that distinction aren't that great. It's been a great relief to us with the advent of these new PSMA PET scans because 
Traditionally, high PSA levels have raised consternation about the possibility of metastatic prostate cancer. And so when um, men are running high PSAs and we're thinking, well, it's probably prostatitis, their biopsy is good, their MRI is good, but the PSA is too high, could it mean that we're missing something? It's, uh, it's a great relief to be able to do a powerful PSMA PET scan and confirm that there's nothing outside the gland. That's, of course, the one thing we uh, are concerned about. In the old days, the best we could do for predicting things outside the gland were high PSA levels and uh, high Gleason scores. And to be safe, we would treat these individuals to prevent the possibility of future spread. Now we've got these scans that can show that the disease has not spread gives us an extra la uh, layer of insurance that we're not missing something. You mentioned that the PSA bounces around a bit when it comes to prostatitis. What ranges would someone see? Ooh, oh boy, we can see uh, PSAs uh, bounce from uh, uh, you know 2 to 12, back to 2 again. Um, and uh, we also see patterns where people just sort of chronically run higher than expected PSAs. We've talked about the concept of PSA density, the ratio between total PSA and prostate size, that there's about a 10 to 1 ratio between, a, uh, say, a 50cc prostate and a PSA of around 5. And so when people start getting, uh, you know, PSAs that are twice as high, we call that a high PSA density, which, you know, instead of being around 5, it's around 10. Uh, for a 50cc prostate. And so those high PSA densities uh, can be sustained in men with prostatitis, uh, which uh, raises concern. If, uh, as I mentioned before, are we missing uh, some underlying higher grade cancer that hasn't been di diagnosed but could be creating a problem? It's always in the back of our mind, especially in men that are on active surveillance. And you mentioned that somebody can get a PSMA scan to check for prostate cancer. If prostate cancer is ruled out and someone just has prostatitis, what is the monitoring like afterwards? A lot of reassurance. Sometimes we'll use uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, but with the advent of better scans and a better understanding of how low-grade prostate cancer behaves, uh, the, uh, the monitoring will still consist of periodic PSA testing, but uh, we try and counsel people that the PSA is not the last word in terms of how their cancer is behaving. There are other factors that affect PSA, uh, such as the size of the gland and the background inflammation from prostatitis. And uh, it's uh, not something that should be driving people into immediate therapy uh, to protect from the possibility of cancer spread. It's a challenging situation because when someone's been given a diagnosis of uh, low-grade pr uh, prostate cancer, that word uh, resonates in their lives and the concern that uh, of a cancer being missed that could be cured now but would spread later without immediate therapy is always uh, on people's minds. And PSA has been one of the main signals. It isn't recommended by active surveillance experts now to implement treatment based on high PSA, but it used to be uh, recommended for that purpose. If a man's PSA was running too high, the active surveillance uh, guidelines from 10, 15 years ago were to implement treatment as a precaution. So there's still hold holdovers of that type of thinking, and it is uh, still a problem where people get so nervous about their high PSA, even though it's just from prostatitis, and end up having treatment uh, for their low-grade cancer when they really don't need it. So if a man has urinary uh, flow issues when it comes to prostatitis, what treatments will be available to him? The treatment of uh, BPH, overactive bladder, and prostatitis sort of are, are kind of rolled together because the treatments that we have medically, uh, alpha blockers and 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, uh, medicines, uh, you know, antispasmodics like Merbetric or Vesicare, they, um, they work variably in different patients and it's sort of a trial and error process, whether it's prostatitis or BPH or, or overactive bladder. Uh, the, um, the trial and error process of starting with the least toxic and perhaps the more uh, familiar medicines, typically an alpha blocker like Flomax, Uroxetrol, or Rapaflow. And if people get some benefit, then continuing that medicine. If they don't, switching to a different medication. Or if uh, they get some benefit but not adequate, maybe adding a second medicine on top of that. Uh, so it is a, kind of a, a crude and not very sophisticated uh, way to approach this, but 
the uh, idea of trying something for a few days, seeing what works for that individual. Many patients have already tried different herbal products like saw palmetto, uh, beta cystostrol and whatnot with some benefit. The different things that are available uh, will work for one individual but not for another. But typically after a week or two of therapy, people can tell if it's helping them personally. Thank you so much for watching this video on prostatitis and prostate cancer. We understand that you guys are looking for answers and we want to be here to help. But the number one thing I want to remind you guys of is you guys are going to make the best treatment decisions for you. Your quality of life matters and those conversations need to come up more often. So please use the information that you're learning here and talk to your medical team about how to better your quality of life and go ahead and leave the topics and the questions that you need answered in the comment section below this video because we want to create more content just for you. Don't forget subscribe to this YouTube channel because we're going to be coming out with those new videos every week.